Hi, how's it going? Before we get into the code, I want to kind of run through a brief overview of some of the components involved in a simple Vulkan program. The thing with Vulkan is it is very explicit. Uh, we are almost like graphics card driver manufacturers. We need to configure every single stage of it, and that's fine. Um, here's basically how it works. So to start with, we have a Vulkan instance, which is pretty similar to an OpenGL context, except as I mentioned before, it's not locked to a single frame. This instance will track things like the name of the program, the uh, version of Vulkan, minimum version that we want to support and things like that. Um, after we've created an instance, we want to query our system and select a physical device to work with. Now, we don't just have to have one, we can have multiple. It's actually more common than you'd think for a system to have more than one physical graphics device. For instance, um, laptops often have a choice between like an off-board um, graphics card, discrete graphics card, or the CPU's integrated graphics, which are, are less performant, but use less power. So the physical device is almost like a read-only thing that we can pretty much just query, and we can query um, what capabilities it has. In order to actually use a device, we have what's called a, simply called a device in Vulkan, but we can think of it as like a logical logical device, a representation of our physical device. This logical device is used in most other operations. Think of it as Vulkan's window into the graphics card. The physical device also has access to a number of um, graphics queue families. Now a queue family is a set of common functions used in a type of operation. Some examples could be the graphics queue family, compute queue family, or transfer queue family for transferring data. However, there is a little bit of overlap here. For instance, um, a graphics queue family will support, um, will support data transfers. Now, what a queue family does is it allocates a queue, and a queue is like an abstract object on which um, commands can be issued. So if we want to draw something, we issue a command on the queue to draw it. If we want to transfer an image from the CPU memory to the GPU memory, we record that command and issue it on a queue. Next part is we have a windowing library. Um, the Two really common examples are GLFW and SDL. They are very, very similar to each other. Um, but for instance, we could use Qt if we wanted or any other windowing library just to handle inputs and things. Um, however, because Vulkan is not tied to a specific platform, um, Vulkan can't talk specifically to our GLFW window. What we need is a a window surface, a Vulkan window object, and that basically abstracts the specific window and lets us talk to it. Okay, now as well as that, we need a swap chain. Now a swap chain is basically um, very similar to a double buffered rendering system. It's a series of persistent images which um, hang around in memory and we can grab an image and we can render to it and stick it back on the swap chain. And then we can grab another image and put that, present that up on the screen and things like that. The funny thing with an image is an image is kind of a composite structure. It has two components. It has a memory, which is somewhere, stored somewhere, um, like a memory allocation for the pixels, but it also has a view. Now what a view is, is basically a protocol for how to access the contents of the memory. Images will have different layouts based on how they're being used. Um, that's a non-trivial thing. So if we want to write to an image, for instance, we give it a linear layout and that's a very predictable kind of layout, but that may not be the optimal layout for reading an image. So to read an image, there's something called a tiled layout or an optimal layout. 
um, which is not as simply addressable, but it is optimized for viewing. So again, we'll be going into all of these components in much more detail when we get to those sections, but that's a, an overview. Also, um, similarly, the memory is not a simple thing either. Okay, the memory is not a single flag. The memory is the physical location where it's located. So there is what we call host visible memory, um, which is basically on the CPU. We can map to it directly. There is host coherent memory, which it's kind of like a print statement. When you type print, that text comes up right away. That's coherent. Um, but if you've worked with C at all, sometimes you need to flush a buffer. So we might write to an image an image's memory. However, it's not host coherent, which means it's waiting, but we need to flush that write operation and things. So there's many, many options there. Um, and then again, changing the location of memory, if we want to change it from, from residing on the CPU, mappable address space, to the GPU, it's not quite as simple as just setting a flag. We actually have to queue up a memory transfer operation and send it through that way. Anyway, so we have images and then image views are referenced by frame buffers and frame buffers are kind of tied in with the swap chain. So then another side to things is we have our graphics pipeline. Now our graphics pipeline in OpenGL pretty much is ready-made. All we need to do is load in a, um, a shader. We can just write text code and load it in, that's fine. Um, and it's good to go. We might wanna change a few things like configure, yeah, we wanna use depth testing or um, backface culling, but we can change that on the fly. Not so with the graphics pipeline. With the graphics pipeline, every single stage needs to be configured. And um, even if it's just a little bit of simple configuration that needs to be done. And if we change anything, we basically need to recreate the graphics pipeline. Okay, so if we have a window and we minimize it and we bring it back up again, well, the graphics pipeline has been destroyed and needs to be recreated. So we also have uh, a few things quite a few things. Um, so we have this graphics pipeline and then we have a, dis a description of it called a pipeline layout. Now this is important because we might have multiple pipelines. So we need to be able to describe them in a generic way with a pipeline layout. Um, as well as that, we have a render pass. A render pass basically describes the types of resources which are used in a render, in a draw call. Um, so the types of attachments that we're going to have, we're going to have a depth image, we're going to have a color image, are we going to clear that when we draw, that sort of thing. Um, a render pass can also have sub passes. So if we want to um, chain up a bunch of different render passes, we can set that up. But by default, we always have to have at least one in there. Um, and then, of course, we have shader modules. So we're used to writing shaders in GL shader language. However, there are some issues with GL shader language. Um, one of those issues is that the error checking is done by the, uh, on a system level, basically, which means one of the downsides to that is when a shader fails, we don't really have good debugging on that. Not so with Vulkan. So with Vulkan, what we do is we take that GLSL we compile that down to uh, SPUR-V, which stands for Standard Portable Intermediate Representation. It's basically bytecode. Now, what this does is it removes the inconsistencies of different vendors using slightly different conventions in GLSL, and it also improves the quality of debugging that we can do. So we compile that down to SPUR-V, SPUR -V, and then we load those in as shader modules. And that's our graphics pipeline. So then the final step is how do we actually draw something? Well, we have a few things as well. Um, for one thing, we want to be able to pass in data, not just vertex, you know, buffer data and everything. We want to pass in uh, matrices for transforms. You want to pass in texture images, all of that. And for that, those things are all called descriptors. Okay. So we have resources. Um, like a matrix for a transformation, a, a buffer of some arbitrary data we might want to pass in, like um, parameters for the environment, you know, the fog color and all of that. 
or um, a bunch of images that we want to sample. Okay, now those um, are referenced by a descriptor set. Now what a descriptor set is, is a set of references to those existing resources. A descriptor set is allocated by a descriptor pool. Okay, so the pool um, allocates a bunch of memory and the, the data is written in there. Well, the descript descriptor sets are written from there. Um, and all of these descriptor sets have to uh, comply to a descriptor layout. Now, the benefit of that is it allows different descriptor sets to exist and be bound under the same layout. Okay, so we take descriptor sets and we bind those to our um, device. And then we need a command buffer to do drawing, basically. So we have a command pool and a command pool allocates a command buffer. And on a command buffer, draw instructions are recorded. So they're kind of pre-baked. And it's very common to do this once per frame, create a new command buffer every frame, record commands every frame. It's fine. It's very lightweight. It doesn't take a lot of um, resources. What does take resources is submitting that command buffer for operation on the queue, on the graphics queue. That takes overhead. And for that reason, one of the major philosophies of Vulkan is to try to set up our scene so that we can draw the whole scene in the minimum amount of draw calls. Now, we're not going to worry about that too much at the moment, because for now, we just want to get the darn thing working, okay? But that is the direction that Vulkan moves in. That's where the, the most um, benefits are seen. Anyway, so as you can see, hopefully, as you can see, there are a lot of tiny little granular components, okay? And in these, these video series, I'm going to be looking at these one at a time in a, a good level of detail and making sure that we have a handle on it, okay? So, um, yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Hope to get into it soon. Bye-bye.